and welcome back to our monthly DNAD sessions here on Adobe Live. Long time no see for everyone from this little audience who's been tuning in since March, pretty much. So welcome back and thanks for always being here. We have a couple of people who are already joining in. We have Steve, Sean, um, yeah, just a bunch of you who are always here um, and watching. I and mean, Steve is saying, or is it Sean? Sean is saying that he has the German stream open and this one. So some great multitasking. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, but if you're watching on YouTube, just a couple housekeeping rules, come over on Behance. We'll be tracking all your questions um, and passing them on to our fantastic guest today because we're joined for this session by art director, Kevin Tamron Hill, who's going to be sharing a bit of his world. Um, so thanks for joining us, Kevin. How are you doing? I'm really good, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Well, virtually here. <laughs> virtually here, exactly. We were talking about this just before the stream, this whole situation madness for the past couple of months. Um, but we made it. Are you joining us from, so tell us a bit more about where you're joining from. Um, and you're yeah. obviously based in the UK for everyone yeah, in the from, audience. From London, um, one of the, you know, born and bred in London, grew up in Southeast and stayed here most of my life. Um, I work in film, which means I live well, not everyone does, but I think a, a high number of people live West London because all the studios are sort of around that side. So I'm in, um, in Housden in Northwest London. Very nice, lovely. And we have, I know today for the session uh, presentation wise, an unseen number of slides. There's um, a lot of actually, slides. <laughs> <laughs> you were very clear on how we'll be moving through the session um, and kind of flicking through. So I'm really excited for that. But I just wanted to say to everyone that you're really in for a treat. Um, so Kevin, I really keen to get started uh, with a bit about your background. Um, your bio seems to cover everything from industrial design to project management within an interior design agency, working yeah. on commercial and um, you know immersive brand experiences, and most importantly, being part of the film and uh, TV art world. So take it away. Tell us more about yourself and kickstart the session. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, my name's Kevin Timon Hill, as, as we said. Uh, so I've been working um, in film and TV for a few years now, but before that I studied aerospace engineering at university. Uh, it's not really something that I had a childhood dream of going into, and honestly, I think I picked it out of uh, one of those careers books that when you're doing your A-levels, which is one of the main the finishing college education that you do here. Um, and I had physics, maths, and art, and I opened the book and it had uh, engineering and I ran down the list and that was what I ended up doing. So uh, that's pretty much how I ended up in my degree. Um, and I think it was about two years into the degree before I realized it wasn't something that I really wanted to do. There was an industrial design um, tutor that came and did a one hour class and he showed us some of his work. He was uh, designing everything from logos and um, interiors of trains and camera bags and I think at that point I realized I just didn't want to be doing aerospace engineering anymore because there was so much more I could I could do with um, with, with my interests and also the fact that I've been um, drawing and painting and whatnot and I think again up until that point I never realized that there was something you could do with that um, as, as simple as that seems now um, another thing I realized was that no one really designs an airplane in aerospace engineering you no one sits down at a drawing board or a computer and draws the shape of an airplane, sends it to the, man the manufacturers and it turns up in a workshop. Um, again, probably something that you think now sounds silly, but I, when I started the degree, that's still what I kind of imagined will happen. Um, so I went straight from my uh, BNG when I graduated to the Royal College of Art um, where I studied industrial design engineering. Um, and the whole thing I loved about the IDE program was the way that it didn't really teach you to design design products or services or any specific thing whatsoever. Uh, the whole course was based around opening up the way that you think, um, teaching you to, to question everything and to ask why and how and, uh, and not really to look at references, but to try and innovate. That was, you know, it's in the title of the, of the course. Um, I sort of left there without a design process, but just the idea that you can challenge everything and walk straight into my first job. Um, very luckily, because it was in 2008, and I think there wasn't a huge amount of jobs opening up then. But my first job was as an interior designer, um, having never worked in interior design or drawn an interior or anything whatsoever. Um, and this was the first drawing that I ever did for any interior design project, which was really basic. It was straight out of university. But the wonderful thing about it was that we built the thing. It was for Harvey Nichols. It was um, a L'Oreal uh, concession stand in Harvey Nichols in Knightsbridge in London. Um, and it was the first thing that I worked on that was built, well, worked on really at all. 
Um, and that job, um, I was there for a while doing retail interiors, um, concessions for L'Oreal, for um, Unilever, for inde independent beauty stands and trade show stands and all sorts of things. And one of the things that I really value about that experience is that the person that I was working with, who was a friend of mine, um, let me fail a lot, you know, you, which is a fantastic way of learning, especially when it comes to building and making things, is that um, we worked really, really quickly and really long hours. And we had pe people working in China and America doing visuals for us. Um, and sometimes if the design didn't work, I learned very quickly it didn't work because it was too expensive. And I was told quite frankly that it was so. But we did a lot of interiors. So we did um, for a group called Rush, we did about seven or eight full design interiors. And I project managed over three years, all of the builds across the UK. Um, so it was about that point, completely coincidentally, that um, I met someone over dinner with a friend who said that um, film and TV might be something that I might be interested in because I had this idea that maybe salons and spas was too specific for me to stay in. Um, and uh, my introduction to the industry was actually a book called, uh, it was a film craft book, which is a series, uh, this particular one on production design, um, was a series of interviews of famous production designers telling stories about how they got into the industry, what they love about the industry, um, you know, people that they've worked with and the sets that they've designed. And I just absolutely fell in love with the idea that you can design anything, like in film art department, production design, you get to do everything. So that whole thing about, you know, airplanes, no one sits in a, in a studio drawing an airplane, you do in film, you just draw the shape of the, whether it's Guardians of the Galaxy or whatever it is, you, you know, if there's a spaceship or Star Wars, you, you draw it and, it and it becomes a reality. And I think straight away, I realized that this was the thing that I've been looking for. Um, so this jumping ahead a little bit, oh, so the, the way I actually got into the industry, which is something that a lot of people ask me was, um, I was honestly lucky enough that uh, someone told me about this, this book called the K's Directory. Um, and it's a book that basically has the listings of hundreds of people, production designers, art directors, supervising art, loads of people, all the way down um, the ranks of the art department. And they, they said to me, look, if you want to get in the industry, this is how you do it. You know, this is the people you've got to call. So I spent months looking through this book with an Excel sheet on my, on my, um, on my computer, writing across everyone on IMDb list and all the films they've worked in and ranking them in the order of, of who I'd like to work with, which sounds, which again, sounds really funny now because as though I was going to get every job I called. But at the time, I just thought this is the way I'm going to do it. And I then went one day uh, after a couple of months through the list and phoned everyone on the list. And that's how I got my first two jobs. I phoned up and said, are you working at the moment? And can I send you my CV? Anyway, so um, this is skipping ahead a bit now. This is the first set that I worked on. Um, it's for a, a film called Pan. Uh, production designer, Aline Bonetto, um, was an absolutely wonderful um, production designer. She really let me sketch some ideas for um, this cable car, which was one of a really small set as part of a, a larger set in the film. Um, and I approached it the way that I did at college, which was no reference, no, I, no, no kind of like looking around to see what existed, just ideas on a page. So tracing paper ideas on a page, um, using a, a, a Sharpie, which you'll see throughout the presentation, I do a lot of because I just love drawing with a Sharpie for some reason, I don't know why. Um, and then the production designer um, saw me through the things that she liked. We went through color passes. We chose out, um, I drew up all the technical drawings um, and I was only a junior draftsman on this one. So um, it was quite a small set to work on, but you can see I was very happy the fact that I got my first set. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, so this is a, a concept. This is the first concept I've ever worked on in film. And again, it only came about because the production designer, I was there one late and she, one night, uh, late one night and um, she needed something for the next morning. And I had been working on the cable car. So she said, uh, can you do something for me quickly in a few hours? So tomorrow morning there was this director meeting and then um, I, it ended up being developed and, and, you know, and into the film. And I was really super happy that this was the first time I got something in a film and, and it was something that I was able to like develop and concept and sketch myself. Um, so the next film, this is me as a draftsman and um, is a completely different film altogether. So this was Tim Burton's Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. The production designer was um, Gavin Bouquet. And this one, 
the design process was very different. Like I was only again drafting, so I wasn't really involved in, um, in in any of the design section of it. But I was given location photos, and we had to develop it in line with the vision of the production designer of how he wanted to adapt this location, this beautiful location that he'd found with um, Tim, the director. Um, and then adapt the, the space and, and develop it so that it worked to deliver all the things that he wanted to show in the design of the set when we were filming on the stage, because it would then need to tie together with the location when we were filming it. So again, I wasn't really learning much in this one about the design process, but it was really sort of honing the technical skills that you get from, from drawing under like some amazing, some amazing art directors that I worked with on this. Um, and here's some um, some stills from from from, um, from the film. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it was it was a really it was a really fantastic show to work on. Um, uh, so this one again is another drafting job. I put this one in because it really shows a different side. I tried to put in a whole bunch of projects that show different approaches from art directing and from drafting. Um, Again, drafting, you don't tend to get a lot of development and design work. So this concept was done by a concept artist, um, Hugh Sukote, I believe. And then, so I was given this concept and told, now you just got to draw it up. But the first thing you do when you look at this is, well, it's like an, from, as, a, as an industrial design background, ergonomic engineering side, I was like, this is fantastic. I love the idea of this technological <laughs> crazy chair that spins and turns and moves around. So um, the first place I went to was the NASA. I go for everything ergonomic. I go to the NASA this website. It's very Da Vinci-like. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Like you, if you ever need any, any kind of information about designing um, chairs and products and how people yeah. fit in the space, the NASA website is a fantastic resource for that stuff. And the second thing is you print a full size. So like, <laughs> this is, I, it just coincidentally that I was the same height as the actor. So uh, that was playing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know you print a full size and you check it because until you check it you don't you, you know you can't figure it out on a drawing always especially when it's human tangible things how how something's going to work so um these, these are all my um starting to be, be more uh, able in 3d 3d modeling but one of the really important things of this was it was so detailed that we had to go backwards and forwards with special effects team it had to move in camera and spin around on its yoke and um for, for action that was happening throughout the sequence of the film um so the the model file that i worked on ended up being the thing that was cnc cut five axis cnc cut which is one of the first times in film that i really got to see that technological crossover between what we drew and directly what was being outputted um, so this was a concept that I then worked up for all of the texture references and how it would then appear in the film. This was the technical drawing um, that we then issue out for, for everyone to know what it has to do in the special effects rig is in there, the yokes and how it's going to spin. Um, and this is how it, how it looked in the film. I didn't get a picture. I have actually got a picture of me sitting in it, but I thought that oh, might no. be running too many. <laughs> um, okay, so this is uh, Wonder Woman. I was assistant art director on this film. And this is again for the production designer, Aline Bonetto, who uh, I'd had some, um, some work with already, some experience working with on Pan. And because of the relationship we built over Pan, it, we formed a, a really, she had trusted me to look after um, one of the larger sets on the film, which is a town of Veld. And um, so this is the first time my creative process massively changed right from university. And it really is based on how Aline likes to see things. She loved references. She told me like hundreds, she wanted hundreds of references. We had to get references for everything. And it became the way of communicating short, because everything moves so quickly, we had to pick out door references, shutter references, texture references. And then I had this Bible book that was massive and every single building in the, in the house, we picked out a door for, we picked out a, a texture for, a paint reference. And it became kind of the Bible of how you, um, would communicate with production. I mean, you can see on this reference board, there's some street view pictures. You know, the references came from Flickr and iStock photo, but also just wandering around French towns with uh, the street view video. Um, and then I went back to my Sharpie because I love Sharpie drawing. Um, I think it's because it's so quick and you just throw it away. Like I always get, if I'm drawing with a pencil, I get too like bogged down with like smudging and rubbing out with a Sharpie. I just do a drawing and then like tuck it. Um, so these are really, I'm showing, I probably wouldn't normally show these because they're, they're really, um, 
pretty rough, but I thought oh, it'd be I interesting. Them. They're great. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's nice to see the creative process that someone goes through, and you know, not every drawing is the best drawing you've ever seen. And quite often, I think coming into the industry, you think, "Wow, someone's work is so uh, so highly polished," and quite often that isn't ninety five percent of what you do in the, in the in the show. Um. So these are all really quick sketches about how uh, mainly the hotel would look in the in the show, um, but simultaneously to that, I was also working 3D uh, in Vectorworks, which is the program that I use to develop the vistas through the town, because um, the um, the production designer really was passionate about wanting to have this up and down nature of the rooms. For her, it was like the embodiment of a French little village was these roofs that go up and down and the, and the way that the buildings were, were clocked and angled and creates all these different facades. So it took a long time sort of rotating buildings by 10 degrees here, five degrees there and all the green roofs, you know, what we could afford to build and missing a house, take up a house, all sorts of things. Um, so these were the 3D model, but again, simultaneously from that, the Sharpie came out again and, <laughs> and I, I printed out my innovations through the drawing because uh, I had at this point my drawing board in front of uh, a great big wall full of all the like loads of the reference that I flicked through before. And whilst I, you're sitting in front of that, you sort of absorb all these images. Oh, that's a really nice light or a lamp, or that's a great chimney. And so these sketches were more developed, neater, but still kind of rough and quick. Like I, I think I did this whole elevation a quarter inch in about a day and a half. Um, I was going to ask very... you about timing, actually. That was yeah. going to be one of the key questions. Like, how much yeah. time do you spend on this and how much is it, you know, yeah. because you said you see this polished work, but it's fascinating to see how much goes behind it um, and right. how much time. I have actually no idea. Um, well, how it's is, interesting because, yeah. like, so all of these original, this is the final version of will probably have been six weeks worth of moving buildings around. So the reason why I was said I was simultaneously also drawing these, which you can see, this isn't the final design of the town because at the bottom, I'm pointing at the screen like you could see that. Um, <laughs> the, at the bottom of this bit, uh, in the final, <laughs> in the final <laughs> design of the of the town, it's a church, but one of the original script versions is a town hall. So uh, at the same time as building the set in 3D and plucking the buildings and working with the skyline. I was working on the kind of feeling drawing, which was which was the ideas for how this would look. And so this sketch was, a, I mean, it was probably a day and a half to two days if you count the, the, the cutting the sections and laying it all up. Um, and I mean, you, you can see the very, very quick rough nature of it, but I mean, it's, it's something that you then you've done and the process of creating it sort of puts in your brain when you're standing on the set, why, something works or doesn't, you've been through the process of drawing it, which I think is one of the nice things you get from uh, pencil or pen drawing that you don't really get from, um, from digital drawing. Uh, so then I kind of went back to concept art um, because it's something I hadn't really ever trained in and was just doing as a side part of my job because it's not really for sort of an, an, an art director role. But I used that then here as, a, as a, uh, an asset to, this was done as a color pass for the whole town. So it allowed me to print the elevations for all of the design of the drawings, but then create something that the plasterers, the painters could see, but also the production designer could look at the whole town in one view and say, this is what I want the colors to look like. Because ultimately it always has to come back to what um, the production designer, um, how they want it to look. And, and if you can't communicate clearly with them, then it becomes a very difficult relationship. So. Um, but hence the reason why um, I've been working in so many platforms at the same time to try and find out what the best way of um, working working with Aline was. It's incredible to see it come to life like this. And we also have Steve in the chat who's saying this is an incredibly detailed, advanced work. <laughs> and I think for all of us, it's mind blowing that we just kind of, you know, we don't really realize how, you know, finely tuned all these, um, you know, this planning is and um, how much effort actually goes into it. From an audience perspective, you're just constantly, you know, consuming this in a very yeah. naive way. Um, so but you phenomenal. can see you know, even, you know, if you skip back to all the references that I had at the beginning, you know, even right down to, if you see right on here, this little corner, I would have found a reference for a broken up plaster wall and put that on a board and gone down to the plaster that was working in that scene. And as the art director, that's one of the things you do is you yeah. communicate to everyone along the scale of, of construction, where something's going to be to, to the direction of what the production designer ultimately wants. So, um, that communication up and down the ladder is something that you have to keep going all the time. 
Um, so these are stills from from Wonder Woman, um, which I I was I was really I mean this was again it's the first big set that I worked on and it was a really big set so I was really excited to have worked on that one. That's quite the name indeed, <laughs> but I know <laughs> you have more for us as well. So we have more, I know. So, <laughs> but also most of the thing that I, I wanted to skip through quite a few little things because all of that to that point were um, were roles that I didn't have a huge creative um, input. I mean, they did on Wonder Woman to some perspective, but it was a lot based on reference. And one of the wonderful things about the two projects that I really wanted to talk about is that in puppetry, you just get to do everything. I mean, it's the, every single object has to be done, sometimes multiple scales, the, the graphics have to be produced, the patterns have to be produced. Um, this is for uh, Isle of Dogs, which is a Wes Anderson stop frame animation film. And Wes Anderson's very particular about what, what he wants. And yeah. um, we're name the... dropping today. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> so th this was um I just absolutely went into this not knowing this film as I mean as assistant art director how much detail I mean you kind of know but you don't really know um every single element in a stop frame animation um is is thought through and designed and not only the way that it appears on screen and the and the patterns and textures but the way it moves um, the construction process can be quite different from, from construction in, in other live action sets because, um, for example, paper that moves in the wind would actually be laminated, small, tiny, thin Japanese rice paper with lead in the middle of it, laminated, so the animator can make it move exactly the way that it needs to move. You know, um, yeah. threads on a, on a piece of rope hanging in, in, a, in a, an image would be wires that have been wrapped in some threads in order to make them look like something that then can be animated. Um, I was actually digging for some facts around this because I found it really mind blowing, this whole universe of Isle of Dogs and um, everything was built by hand, by hand, like you were saying, and including dust clouds with cotton wool and waves right. of water with sheets of plastic wrap. And um, I mean, it's incredible. Absolutely mind blowing. One, <laughs> one, one of the things is that uh, everything had to be tested, tested for animation and tested for um, how it would look. And um, so for example, the cling film, I know they did quite a lot of work on, uh, it was, wasn't, I wasn't there at the time, they did a lot of work on spinning the cling film to get the exact look to be able to animate it. And then they had to post po uh, comp that into the shots. Um, one of the things that you get when you start on a stop frame animation, like I did halfway through um, half of reproduction because it was like two and a half years. Um, and I, I did about 14 months on it, uh, 12 months on it. And um, I got to watch the film when I started on the job, which is just completely bizarre, right. yeah. unexpected <laughs> thing because it takes so long to make every piece of um, set and, and to, to animate every piece of action that the entire film is put together in this kind of style. We have uh, an animatic, which is an animated storyboard. And this is one of Jay's drawings. He's a storyboard artist who works really closely with Wes to do, you can see how much detail is in this. So when you get handed one of these storyboards, you know the production designer is fed into Wes and Jay. Wes and Jay have worked really detailed, placing every single object to line up exactly how it is. So you have to take that seriously. So Wes's storyboards are way more serious to take uh, direction for the design for than, um, than a lot of other storyboards. Um, but again, you know, I get, at this point, I've kind of worked out that I need my starting block because I'm I, rather than starting on a blank piece of paper is to go through reference. So. I was, you know, looking at everywhere from, again, Flickr to people's holiday photos to find uh, shrine references to take back to the storyboard to look at every single object and what could these objects be? Because you don't always, you're moving so quickly, you don't really get to sit down with Wes and ask, oh, what that's supposed to be, you know, or Jay is busy already on something else. Um, so this was the concept that I did for uh, Isle of Dogs based on this storyboard. There are a few images in between the two, but I had to start cutting slides at some point. So this is the my... one. No, this is actually uh, great. Bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a minute. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, so every single thing here you can see is based on an element that was in the storyboard. And then I've taken and interpreted from the reference into the final concept. Um, and then every object in here has to be broken out and created. Um, but the first point, which is here, is a, a camera move, which, um, so I moved into the digital world, and we're going to show a video now, it just shows um, 
how I was looking at how the camera would move between the two um, positions and show what we can see from each of them. Brilliant, let's play the video then. So at that point, I'm now in the 3D world and looking at all of the different ways that um, I've matched to a 2D visual, but I'm breaking it down to how we're going to create the set. Uh, but we had a model maker creating on Isle of Dogs, something that I've never seen before, which was we do a lot of foam card model making in, in film, but we made all the sets in foam one to one because we had the actual camera set up that we were going to be using or a camera kit similar to it, where Bonnie, our model maker, um, made all of the pieces based on the drawings that I was working up in 3D so that we could then get a test shot with that camera move that I showed you so that Wes can then see those frames and say, you know what, I liked it in 2D, but it doesn't work in 3D. And that's where the changes happen and the feed feedback loop happen. Um, so then I got back some of the things that, that I had to make changes. So I had to squish the set to make it have less perspective so that it was a slight cheat. And that was one of the changes that we made. Um, but then the next thing that I had to do was work out how an animator could actually work on the set. An animator needs between 30 and 40 centimeters space maximum from their body to the front of the set. This was about a two and a half, three meter set. So everything had to be broken apart into pieces. That means that you can film the set in passes. So an animator can get close enough to animate the puppet. But then what happens is they shoot that piece of action and then we break away another piece of set and then they shoot the next piece of action with the animator being able to move closer. And then uh, visual effects then comp all of the, the pieces that had been filmed together to make the fully combined set again. Um, so there's a lot more detail in uh, working in, in stop frame animation in how the actual construction is done of the overall set, because you have to consider all of those breakpoints and how the sets can be screwed tightly together but also work for, um, for the animators and, and allow them to move each of the independent pieces. Um, I think uh, this is, so this is the breakdown. So just to show you the level of detail, so I won't go yeah. through everything, but <laughs> Eno, our graphic design, I mean, really everything had to be created. So I had a reference, she, uh, Ina created this for us. So we had a reference picture, which is my finding something from a, a shrine picture. And then I had done something for the concept art and then Ina had to create a graphic piece of artwork for, for the actual shoot and then print them, many of them on gold papers. And, and it was a super complicated process to get all of those designed. Every single thing had to be sculpted. You know, every single thing, this is to for scale reference had to be painted wow. in yeah. tiny detail um, and brought into set. And then one of the things I loved about this and we're gonna go into later of the dark crystal stuff is starting to see the combination of of um, technology and, and the art department. You know, so these flower heads are so small, these chrysanthemum heads that we 3D printed them, but then uh, Sarah, the person that was making them, hand, we, we laser cut all of the leaves and she hand rolled with a, with a metal spatula and to think each of those leaves to get them to do the shape to make them feel more realistic. And then they were painted and put in the set. Um, so, we're going to show you this, the, the section, the video here of the actual set so that you can see how the final thing looked in the film. Great, another minute video coming up. Great. Um, so the, the next set we're going to go into is another Isle of Dogs one. And this one was, I think, probably my favorite over the shrine. It was the, the sake bar, which is quite a small set, but quite a lot of the film was, about two minutes of the film was in there. And these were the animatic frames. Uh, and I was given these and um, some reference to start with. But 
what's interesting when you see all of these views is quite often the frames from from Isle of Dogs. There was only one or two shots that you had to, to focus on, but because so much was done in this set, we had to really think about how the set would be developed in every view and how it could change to line things up the way Westwood wanted. His brief was that it had to feel like it was part of the laboratory, which is supposed to be right next door to this bar. It was almost where the scientists went to eat. And then there was some references like from The Shining with a lit backlit bar, um, a bar that combines the laboratory feel with sort of a drinking vibe. And then I just did a ton again of this referencing, you know, to find out anything that was interesting. A lot of people have that problem. You have like the blank page issue where you just don't know what to do. And for me, the first thing is always reference hunt and just, you just fill your brain with ideas so quickly. So which resources um, do you use for that referencing? Like how, where do you go? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everything, everything. I mean, Flickr, I mean, Google, I would say the one thing that brings most people to, to not get very far is Google Images. If you rely yeah. too much on one on Google Images, everyone gets the same 10 pics. It's quite, you know, it's quite restrictive. So, you know, I will look on, at, at everything one. from Flickr and holiday snaps and Instagram tags and Twitter tags but through um, Pinterest. Pinterest is a great one because it also recommends loads of images. I um, was going I to say Pinterest earlier yeah. on. I was like, I'm just going to be really ignorant and say Pinterest. No, it's I'm, great. I'm not no. going to say anything. <laughs> Pinterest is often where I also keep quite a lot of stuff when I'm trying to like right. quickly get as much reference as possible because then yeah. without having to click in and download the high res every time, you can get quite a lot and then just keep it somewhere. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of like iStock photo and I mean, tons of there's so many stock photo sites as well. And Adobe has a great references with loads of reference videos for stock photos as well now. So, I mean, the, the nice thing about having so many sites that you can pick up photo references from is that you should just keep going until you're, you're just saturated. And that's what I tend to The do. brain is full. Yeah. It's full. <laughs> and then you, then you can start work. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. Um, this was the concept that I that I worked on based on the storyboard um, that, that I was given from Wes, and he really liked it. So the original concept was there was a lot less um, graphics on the walls, but we we kept going and going to get that kind of golden guy, which is the the Tokyo bars area reference. Um, so I did these concept visuals um, to to for each three of the key frames from the film. And then we went back to this full-size maquette again, where we built the entire thing in card and shot each of the frames as it, they would have been in the storyboard. And you can see here, we even make a note of the exact lens and crop into the image because uh, in order to recreate this later on, the DOP has to have all those notes from how we did the maquette because Wes is signing off this maquette if you don't capture that information, that's the real issue. Um, so then this is the technical drawings. And then one of the really nice things that I loved about this set was on the right hand side of this image, you can see the breakdown of the storyboards. And then on the left hand side, it's all the different ways the set had to be built using the walls to make those storyboards work. Because Wes doesn't care if in one image, the door is on the left and then the next image it's in the center <laughs> because he's, he's, he really right. wants every image to be beautiful. So, you know, every time the camera is pointing at something, everything in the shot looks fantastic because Continuity is less important than the image looking great, you know, and, and one of the things we did with this is we moved the walls around. You can see they're made modular so that every shot you can have them in the order that makes sense to make the best looking image. Um, and these are the stills from from the film. And well, this is a, a behind the scenes because you can really see the level of detail. Uh, Erica and the graphics team had, I, I mean, I kind of probably shot them a little bit with the amount of graphics within the concept, but they were they had to create every single artwork for these. And these were like less than postage stamp size. That's nice. um, and I also want to talk about the puppets because there were, I also read there was, you know, like something like a thousand puppets, 500 dogs, 500 humans, and each individual character was made in different scales and, um, you know, took about weeks, weeks and weeks and months to build. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's just, there's also this kind of set and the puppets that fit within that and the whole work is just phenomenal. Um, it was so much work. I mean, the puppets were an entirely, uh, I couldn't even get to grips with the amount of small detailed work. Every hair is put in, if anyone hasn't seen it, there's plenty of um, behind the scenes videos from Isle of Dogs where they're pin pushed into the head, the hairs. Um, you, this is how you can see their shot, that their entire body has a skeleton inside and then they're added to, and each of the mouth sections is replaceable. It's, I mean, the, the animators, I have, I would never have the patience they have. It's, <laughs> they're moving things 
24 frames a second, they're making the move one twenty-fourth of a second so that you can perceive the film the way that we see it. It's uh, an incredible amount of work. Um, okay, so these are the still frames from this. And the next last one I wanted to work on, because I realized it's gone a, a little bit long, no. is, uh, <laughs> is, um, is The Dark Crystal, which for me is abs it was just my first full art director credit. And as, as anyone that knows the original film, that's like, uh, it's in a huge art department um, cult film. I mean, everything in it is fantasy. Brian Froud's vision and, and Jim Henson Company's um, uh, vision across the whole of it is just so phenomenal. And we were really tasked with how can we create the um, something that's really captures the essence, excuse the pun, I really wanted to say that, of the original film and put it into our new sets for the series. And um, so this here you can kind of see, so the, uh, the top picture is a still from the original film and the lower one is um, my interpretation of how we could build our set to work in a way that captures that feel, um, but had to deliver quite a lot more than what the original one did. Um, we, so if you, that first frame that I just showed you is basically everything on the, on the left side of the, of the image. And on the right side was something that we had to create, Gavin, the production designer, um, really wanted to build a much larger space because the, there's a lot of changes between the original film and this one. Um, but to, there was a lot more of the series. I mean, there was something like a tenth of the series took part at, at various points in the lab and antechamber. So we had to have more space to create more visual interest um, throughout the film. So these were some of the 3D visuals. We were working really quickly here. So there's no textures involved. It's quite, um, we had a lot to do in a short period of time because you know 10 episodes of a series and a lot of sets um so this were these were the original visuals but at the same time we had to start thinking about how the worlds were um, related um this was uh, the crystal chamber and how it sits above the um uh, the lab and the um, draining room uh, which is which is the area here and so this whole contraption which you see which changes between the two of them is in the crystal shaft so this is a reference that Gavin wanted us to recreate the design of the crystal mm. shaft for and we had um, Lee Oliver was the concept artist for um, special uh, for set deck and he worked on these beautiful visuals of how the crystal would be changing position from the two spaces um, and it would be kind of whipped in to position by visual effects, but ultimately we built the thing practically in camera. So anytime it was sat there still, it, it actually was, was there in the shot and that's how it looked in the film, in the, in the series. Um, so my construction drawings, the thing that I love about the Dark Crystal and the whole, um, the process about working on it was that we had to, re to get things done so quickly we combined so much technology in with the um, traditional construction skills across film uh, filmmaking. So all of these elements that we had, like arches and columns that were across all the sets, actually, quite a lot of the sets, we had to break up between what could be done by a five axis CNC cutter or 3D printer, um, what would be done by our poly sculptors or our plaster shop. And, depending on how much time we had or how much money we had, which inevitably wasn't gonna be enough because we had, it's so much more expensive to do curves and complex organic shapes and nothing in the dark crystal is straight. Everything is the beautiful illustrations of Brian Froud, you know, fairy-like, crazy, wonderful shapes. And we drew on that. And then Gavin's um, progression of that as the production designer was to take those curves and to create entirely new worlds, which we had to do for the series based on that. Um, so the thing that you don't see, and I really wanted to talk about for, for Dark Crystal is the, the behind the scenes world. You know, you get to see with, with Jim Henson Company, a fantastic, beautiful on camera thing, but what you don't really appreciate from just watching the show is the amount of, um, behind the scenes construction that goes on. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from this visual, you can see all the squares or the blue, red and green grids. Underneath yeah. the sets, all the sets are built on a four foot, two foot, four foot or two foot rostrum um, and it's all a combination of which. And that's because the puppets move across the, 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 um, the sets at different heights. And so, uh, and, and sometimes multiple heights at the same time. So we had to be able to lift the tiles that you see in the actual set 
mark them, if you look at the bottom right of that image, you can see we spray painted around the tile. So we knew that the shape was looking where it was going to have to go back because we had to put it back, you know, in 10 minutes. Numbered it and put it off set. And then every single section of set had to have a numbered piece of rostrum that could be lifted out and put into position. So the finished set looked like that, but underneath it was this grid of um, subterranean platforms that you could take out and drop in a puppeteer. So the puppeteers either were on butt dollies like this, you can see a sketchy with Louis doing a shot directly onto him, or there was a small puppeteer in the actual costume walking on the set for the, the full length of pictures. Or we had multiple layers of set taken out so that you could have, which is the most comfortable way of performing a, a sketchy stood two foot below the set um, with all of the sketchy higher up. And then the gelflings and the podlings needed a four foot gap. So the middle one, you can see there would have been um, a, uh, a, a gelfling sat in the chair about to be drained. And they, the puppeteer for that needed to be four foot below stood on the floor. So the, the construction was amazing. The, the level of detail that they did, um, that the uh, palace scenery did on this was just absolutely fantastic. And then you can see the amount of people that were in these tiny sets because the puppeteers were obviously bigger than a lot of the puppets when ultimately it ends up looking like this. So, you know, when the floor was out, sometimes we would have this, this many people in the set, but we actually on camera, we're only seeing something like this. And it was just the amount of, that wasn't on camera was, was, uh, was amazing. Um, so this is how the lab looked uh, in the film, in the, in the series. Um, this last, so this is the second to last set I was going to look through. This is the catacombs, which is one of the sets from the original film, but this was reworked to be our own stamp on it. Um, so we started again with reference about how we wanted it to look and, and, and what this kind of drip feeling would be. But on the first meeting with the director, he said it needed to be more fantasy. It had to, have to look dark crystal. So everything had to be not just the stalactite. We wanted he wanted it to be thorns and horns and you know some some way that there was a spiral with its own gravitational force that would a drip would pick up on the spiral at one point and land in a spiral at the bottom. So we created these horns. Um, th these were some images that I did for creating the space so that you could shoot in what was actually a very small space, but to look like many different sets depending where you filmed it from because we, did, we had to do quite a lot of filming for quite a small set here. Um, and then we had the sculptors sculpt these horned pieces and, um, and cast them in foam so that we could make them safer. And it was literally a dirty small job going into the set in a very confined space and creating what would then ultimately be these um, very dark crystal under the, uh, under the castle catacombs. Um, these were some stills about how it ended up in, in the series. And what I loved about it is the silhouettes. Like you really see on the left, like that little photo reference I showed you of the horn that was on the side of a plant. You know, that's where you, those little details you pick up. And I think the feeling of the teeth crunching down on, you know, the scariness of the Skeksis and you're being underneath the castle is what we were trying to portray. And I, I felt like that was one of the, a lovely small set to work on on the show. Um, and then this is the last set. <laughs> Um, no, I love this. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, this this was uh, this is absolutely. I I, mean, I can't say this is I think the favorite set that I ever worked on. To be honest, it was um, uh, again it was the same. You know, production designer Gavin Bouquet. These were some concept visuals that were done quite early on. Um, but then Gavin worked with a in art department concept model maker to do a plasticine model. And the reason I really love this set is it combines every possible craft and technological advance that we've had in the art department into one set. And my job was to mash it all together. Like I wasn't like designing every detail of the set. I was taking all these clever components and pushing them together to make a set out of it. So Richard, the concept model maker made these plasticine uh, first draft model, or which is, this is about the fourth draft, I think. And then we took them off and we sculpted, uh, we scanned in 3D scan the plasticine models, every single one of them, so that we were able to take these into the computer once they've been signed off in plasticine and create them in uh, into my computer world. And I could go in and then start breaking out the pieces of model that we would then create. So uh, one of our 3D sculptors um, from 
um, I think using ZBrush, then created much more detailed houses that would be created and 3D printed by five axis cutting because there was so much detail done in the computer model file. We didn't want to lose that by issuing it and, and having a, a new sculptor on the floor of the workshop reinterpreting it. So we kept that work by then five axis CNC cutting these. And then I had to start melding together the, the world of the ZBrush with the plasticine world into a new file that would allow us to combine the carpentry pieces that we were going to make with the pieces that we'd scanned and the pieces that were 3D sculpted. So these were seeing these were some images that were from the um, my, my file combining all the elements. And what I was doing was trying to create as much set as possible because we were here for almost a whole episode once we put it together. Um, and so every scene, we, we basically tried to create vistas in every direction. And we had, I think, a 270 degree um, wraparound backing. And so even the backing, we had to think about not only how it was going to look on set, but what, where were we going to see it? So the red line was me marking on the first draft backing painting that I'd done um, of where the interesting points were going to be. And then uh, one of our concept artists, Max, then you can see it here, went in and did this beautiful painting um, using the brief that I'd done before and photos from, from the set and, 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 and the canopy and created this brief for the, um, for the backing painter to then paint full size, which was like 180 foot around the set. Um, but then combining, again, there's this rostrum plan again. Everything here had to be, again, liftable and um, the puppets had to move around it. And what we ended up doing was we created these avenues around the set you know, all throughout so that we were there for so long, you could, um, Louis and Eric, the director and DOP could film it from so many different angles and really create a much larger town than there really was. Um, but then we also had these movable, truckable pieces that could be moved off the front of the set because as you can see at the bottom left right hand corner there's still an opening that wasn't going to be covered by backing and we needed to move these pieces around with these huge trees on so that you could cover anything when the camera was going to turn and see something off the set so these became 3d sculpts that weren't five axis cuts so they were modeled in 3d but then these sculptors that were the poly sculptors with hot wire nail guns or like these, these kind of brushes with nails in all sorts of look that look like torture devices these <laughs> super talented um, sculptors made, um, made all these components for the set. And um, this is, again, you can see right from start to finish where we had a concept model maker by hand making a clay model that we then scanned in 3D, but then without touching a single thing, we put it onto the five axis CNC cutter, made it full scale by scaling up in the computer. And then our plasterers went over it and added all the beautiful textures and the painters brought it to life. Um, so. The thing that I loved about this was that technologically we combined every possible way that we could to make the set in a, the most cost efficient way, but utilizing all the skills we had. And then poor Danny, the, the, the um, standby art director, had to keep track of where all the rostrums went, because um, the, you'll see in a second that the rostrums come out and he had to keep number of where they've come from because the specific ground latex that's been put in all across the set had to go back in exactly the same place. Oh my so his job was taking them in and out for every shot and then keeping a track of where they went back in because nearly every single shot needed um, the puppeteers to come in and out. And you can see here, this is I think one of the best skills I've got of, of how the Gelfling's access is um, and uh, and then this is some photos. I love the praise that we're getting for everyone you work with because it seems to be this patient <laughs> job that I feel I wouldn't be able to do either. Um, but it's so much precision and um, yeah, just time invested in that. I, I mean, and, and also the whole of the Netflix family and the Jim Henson family were, mm. I mean, I was on that for 14 months and it was a wonderful experience. Louis Le Perrier, the, the, the director, shot all 10 episodes, you know, and he operated the camera throughout as well. The production design was there like the whole way through. We really became a close knit family with the puppeteers. And I think for me, it's the kind of job that just doesn't happen very often. You're, you're right there making the film from the art department. Um, and I would you know, jump on a Jim Henson job anytime because they are, um, it was a, a wonderful experience. 
so is there a feeling the... of sadness as well when this is over? I just feel like you work on this for 14 months and then you just have to let it go and move on. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> and then I went on, but I, you know, at, at this point I left this job and then I went on to film another with Anthony job. So I was super oh. happy and excited. Then I was enough. like, I've offered everything. <laughs> and that's with all of these things, they come to an end and then you, you've just got to hope that when you see the final thing, everyone else is, um, well, actually it's normally like waiting to see what the end result is because very rarely in the art department do you get to see um how it ends up looking so that's that's me I've, I've kind of that's the last of my slides oh brilliant i mean everyone that's in the like chat marathon is loving us. i know we just have steve who's saying man this is only one hour trying to see something this detail rich <laughs> and enriching needs to be at least two hours long so everyone is loving this um, oh, good. and okay. It's just so nice to see this kind of magical process of bringing this art to life from your end. And, um, you know, your design approach is getting a lot of love from the chat for sure. Um, and we've got, yeah, Ryan, you're saying I really enjoyed this talk um, and seeing these uh, different design processes and different approaches to projects. The exploration and visual research really pay off. Um, and we also had a comment earlier on about, uh, yeah, watching Isle of Dogs from a couple of people as well. So I think we'll definitely have everyone's plans for tonight yeah, <laughs> sorted. Yeah, watch that. It's a beautiful film. Um, and earlier on, a little bit about the chair as well. We had, I think, was it Sean or Steve who was saying um, that you didn't have a, a cup holder? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, there was a cup there. holder. There was? There was. There was. <laughs> Look, go back and watch the film. He's got a Coca Cola in there he and does. a post it note on the other side. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Ryan's saying is uh, well done for the career. There's such a great sense of progression in your work. Keep it up. Um, but I also had a couple of questions regarding, you know, you talked a bit about technology and craft in the art department. And um, how have you seen kind of progress there during your career? I'm really interested to see how or hear how this changed and allowed you to create more precisely or achieve new kind of scale of work. Um, what's your yeah. kind of feedback on that? I, um, I think, I mean, even just testament, I tried to sort of touch a little bit on for each of the projects. It definitely feels like we're more and more going from the ability of drawing something in the office and having appear on on the set and i think as far as technology is coming into the art department we'll never be able to to just print a set i love the idea that you're going to go in and construction are going to tweak this and touch that and and all those real world textures that come from really making something and the crafts that are in in, in film and tv construction but one of the the things that's really exciting is that we in the art department can really draw something, model something, and um, and have it turn up on the stage, you know, and using those skills where they're um, where they're accessible and and cost relevant to create something the best way can. And sometimes it's just timing that you need to to five axis cut it or you need to print it. And and sometimes it's better to make it in clay and have a sculptor there because you don't know what it is until you start seeing it. And I think using those tools as part of your design process is super as much valuable as it is um, just a manufacturing process. One of the things I didn't mention was in in um, Dark Crystal, we had at least three and at one point four the tabletop three um, D printers in the office running the entire time I was on the job. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Bouquet is a wonderful designer who loves technology and his his everything was printed. We, we had sculptors make things up so that we could print a board game. You'll see it in the Art of um, Dark Crystal book. There's a picture of it um, where he wanted to plan the world. So he designed effectively a board game that he printed every single piece on a hexagon so you could pick up one of the, the the town of Harav and move it over here or make it taller so you can communicate with the with Netflix and Jim Henson and, and the director, the geography of the landscape. I mean, it was, we used it for, as a tool for everything. It just feels like in terms of job description, there isn't one because you have to have this interest and this curiosity for testing things out, right? And just using all right. these tools and saying, actually, I'm going to try this really kind of hands-on approach because everything is pretty much hands-on and trying it out. And I'm sure a lot of testing and failing as well, um, yeah. realistically. Um, and we have Bradley who's saying, this is an amazing example for CTE teachers to show art blends with tech robotic robotics. Uh, as you so well articulated them and so that was really and, amazing. you know one of the things that i think is really important that we have to start talking about is mm -hmm. in the art department generally we've had a really lucky few years that we the, the, the industry is growing and there's you know Shep shepperton is growing and pinewood is growing and the studios are building more stages we really need young people at schools to to realize that art is a valuable skill you know um there are as many people 
that came from fine art backgrounds as came from engineering background. I just came through this route. And I think telling someone that they have something valuable in their skill set, which is sometimes just a really good eye, and that there is a job there that exists that is exciting and creative and doesn't mean you have to just be um because i think when i did my art a level i really thought that the only progression for art was a um uh you know on the breadline until you make it big artist like i didn't have an idea that there was a career path beyond that and maybe and so in film there were a huge amount of creative roles from sculpting and fine art to graphics and uh, and, and in the art department like myself or set deck and dressing and I think educating people at school and college that these job roles exist is, is, is a really great start to filling a skill shortage that we're going to have in the future. Absolutely. It's really refreshing to hear that, you know, there are different career paths that deviate from the norm as well to just, you know, landing into some, you know, some roles um, such as art directing or um, just the art world more generally. So really nice to hear. Um, my curiosity as well leads me on to um, what kind of projects do you, you haven't worked on uh, so far that you would find really interesting or challenging or kind of <laughs> you've always kind of wondered and because these were also different in terms of design approach and processes. Is there something that you're just really wanting to try out? Um, I don't know. I mean, I would love to do, you know, the big Star Wars fantasy. I haven't yeah. done one of those big kind of spaceships and things, but, you know, I've been really lucky to build relationships with certain um, designers who have given me a certain amount of trust to develop ideas with them. And I think way more valuable than the type of film you work on is the relationship with the team that you have, because it, the, the designers that I've worked with have really given me the freedom to interpret their design work with them to, to create something. And I would take a, a great relationship with a designer that trusts me over the type of project any any time. Yeah. And this team, but is mentorship also something that's worth mentioning in terms of just having, you know, someone there who might be, you know, giving you advice or just coaching you or any yeah. kind of tips? And... I think that that's something we should yeah. be looking as an industry at, mm. uh, to be honest. There isn't much of it right now. Uh, mm. As far as I'm aware, there's, there's not a huge amount of um, sort of uh, active mentorship. But, you know, I, I know that unions like the Bechtu Union and the British Film Designers Guild they are proactively talking now about how can we mentor young people into the industry. And if that means doing things like portfolio workshops or going to schools or doing webinars for schools to talk about, you know, these are all the wonderful things you could be doing with your creative output. Um, and I think that's where it really needs to start. And, and um, it's, it's nice to hear that the unions um, that work for the art department in film and TV are starting to talk about that. And I hope that very soon schools will have online resources that they can find these things because um, until you can pair people up somehow that those mentorships will never exist. Yeah and I think especially during this current time and I think we can also um, finish on these last couple of questions but you know the the change that's coming up in the next years is going to be really interesting with yeah. you know the current pandemic and um, the way we also have to you know socially distance how have you seen this shift in terms of just yeah set and um, the film industry being affected I mean obviously we talked about you working from home and all of us <laughs> being um, yeah. you know showing way too much on our zoom background I know. Um, but you know how has that this affected you personally and how do you think the industry is kind of adapting at the moment it was a very sharp shock to, to I think a lot of people in the film industry when COVID-19 happened because uh, in the space of two weeks, nearly everyone I know went out of a job um, and it exposed quite a, uh, a brutal side to the whole industry is that you, you really are, um, if, I think maybe 10% of everyone that, was, that could have been furloughed was furloughed because a lot of the industry are also freelancers. Um, so, Moving forward, I've just gone back to work on a project and it's really great to see how serious it's uh, Warner Brothers TV and Netflix project. And it's really great to see how serious they're taking um, the, the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and one of the things I hope that we can do is change the industry moving forward, that we can capture better um, some, some of the issues that have brought us up to the point where we can see everyone going out of work. And one of the things would be, how do we work from home? You know, we're very much an in the room industry. And if we can come up with ways, because we've had to, about how we can work remotely, how we can work better for our health, and then I, I hope that that's a positive that we can, we can take from that. And I think working from home and remotely and all of the 
you know, the Zoom calls that everyone I'm sure are tired of, but we're going to have to get very used to <laughs> is, yeah. is, I think we can see it as a positive as we go forward. Great. No, really appreciate your feedback on that as well. And um, to wrap up as well, we have um, Steve and Sean that we've lost in the chat who are talking about you potentially designing an actual spaceship um, <laughs> and some requests <laughs> that you go into space effects. <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, hope. <laughs> maybe that's next on the on in the line in terms of projects um but yeah really great having you today we're actually right on the dot and um, so i think we covered quite a lot right. and really great to hear that everyone wants to see more of this um so okay. thanks again i hope you had a great time on the stream but i did it's been well. great fun thank you for having me brilliant thanks kevin and thanks everyone tuning in as usual um you're always here which is great to see um and we'll see you again for another dmad uh, session inspirational session um next month so that's us for today and you can see us in adobe live uk obviously later on today at 12. Um, so yeah see you all you. bye bye, bye. <laughs>